بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد من الله على المؤمنين إذ بعث فيهم رسولا من أنفسهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Elders, brothers, sisters, friends, السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته As we approach the tenth night of Muharram, the day of Ashura. And this is a season of learning, a season of self-development, a season of reflection, and a season of tragedy. So as we approach the end, both our focus on learning remains, but our focus on the events and how they unfolded and the history of uh, the backdrop of Ashura, we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of both what actually happened, the reasons for it, and what we can learn from it. And this is a crucial point that we often neglect. We often think of religion, think of messengers as deliverers of a message, almost like postmen. Somebody who would deliver a letter to you, the contents of which are important, but that's it. So the role of the postman in the letter you get is not very much, right? Their role is to take it from A, bring it to B, make sure you get it correctly, deliver to the right address without any modifications. Their role isn't, has nothing to do to add to the value of the letter beyond delivery. And often we make that mistakes when, that this mistake, when we look at the prophets, previous prophets to the, our own prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And also when it comes to the Imams, who are the continuation of that prophet, and I'll touch on this, why this makes a lot of sense. So we, we think of the message, we think of the content, but we don't think of the methods and the delivery. We think of the words, but we don't think of their context. And we do this often. And in doing so, we miss a lot of the value of prophethood and of the messengers. They deliver a lot more value than simply delivering a revelation that has the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's much more to it than that. And so, by ignoring this message, we find ourselves centuries later, living in the West, living as a minority amongst a majority, feeling a bit irrelevant, we don't have much of a voice, we, ha we don't have much of a say, we don't have much of an influence, it's how we might feel, and then we struggle what to do. And so, with this sense of uh, limited relevance, you get all sorts of possible reactions from us. So there are some who would give up completely on anything they had. 
they kind of not understanding the value of what they had, they just give it up completely and get inspired by uh, a piece of evidence they hear or some uh, eloquent argument or a piece of news or even pressure. They just give up. There are some who will not give up completely but almost give up. You know, they, they turn up in Muharram, say, you know, I've done my duty, this is my dose, I've had my top up. Uh, I'm a good person, I'm a lover of Imam Hussein, and so I'm just going to disappear for the rest of the year. I'm going to ignore 90% of what was said, and I'll forget the other 10%. And I will kind of keep convincing myself that I've done my bit, and then 360 or so days go by, and then I'll show up again and then feel that I have contributed, that I'm there. In reality, for the rest of the year, I'm, I'm, I'm under so much pressure that I just feel that this stuff is not relevant. This stuff is suitable for Muharram. And may, I might not even keep my prayers because I have work, you know. I might not do them on time. I'll just group them all and do them in an evening one day. And then maybe some evenings I'm too busy still because these assignments at work are really intense. So I'll just do them at some other time. And then Muharram comes and I'll turn up and say, I'll be a good person. And there is another version of us, kind of, these are not all versions, but you know, another approach, who says we have this beautiful message, this beautiful religion. We should really spread it to this, our communities. There's, the time is ripe. We have something really beautiful. We should communicate it. We should, we should, we should. And between these two, there's all sorts of, ideas and priorities and approaches and what we're missing here is a crucial point is that the prophet and the prophets before him they also lived as minorities in areas that didn't believe in them by definition they brought in a new religion there's a lot of beauty in that and see how they handled that process, how they managed the method, how they delivered the message, how they coped. It's not just the what of the message, but the how of the message. And so there is so much value to us, especially to us, especially relevant to us, who are facing this transition to kind of understand where our priorities lie, what kind of toolkit we need, and then how do we go from being um, feeling under pressure to developing our self-confidence to offering these communities that we live in this beautiful thing that we have. After all, we followers of Ahlul Bayt are lovers of people. We care. We don't have a message of hate. We don't have a message of extremism. We don't force anyone to follow. All we say is this is what we have. This is our evidence. This is something we feel so happy about, we feel that it's so precious that we dedicate some of our lives to it and we want to offer it to you. If you want to take it, brilliant. If you want to leave it, brilliant. But this process of producing these kind of people is not an easy process. You see, it's very easy to produce um, preachers of hate. It's very easy to produce Bin Ladens. It's actually not hard at all. You just challenge people, put them in difficult situation, take away their knowledge and a bit of their mind and become crazy. That's not hard. What is hard is to produce something. You see, destruction is easy. Construction is hard. If you've ever watched a building being kind of rebuilt from scratch, you see within a couple of days, they have destroyed the building. And then maybe three years later, before the new building shows up. Right? Construction is much harder than destruction. And construction, destruction doesn't need much. Construction requires architects and all sorts of engineers and all sorts of builders and skilled people. It's a process. And so if we want to be in that position, and we are, by the way, my brothers and sisters, we actually have something we're missing. We are ambassadors of this religion. We are in the same team as the Prophet wasallam, led by Imam al-Mahdi. We're actually on his team. We have that support, that guidance, that confidence that we should have, that we have something we want to deliver, first of all to protect ourselves and then to go to our communities and then to go to the wider society as we've discussed on previous nights. So kind of understanding the methodology is really important and the Quran 
tells us this in multiple verses. So in this particular verse that I quoted in Surah Al-Imran, Surah 3, verse 164, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa tells us, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has done us a favor, has bestowed a favor upon us, that He sent amongst us a messenger. From us, so a messenger, Allah sent a messenger to the believers from them. From Why is it important to be from them? I'll come to this in a second. What, what are the functions of this messenger? Yetlu alayhim ayati. He recites the verses. That's the content, that's the what of the message. Yetlu alayhim ayati. Delivery. Wayuzakihim. Purifies them. That's got nothing to do with the delivery of the message, that's an additional role. Purify them. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And teaches them the book. His role isn't just to deliver the book, but rather to teach it. And also to teach additional things. Hikmah. And this, this وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ has a lot of method built in. You know in science, the results are often less important than the method. If the method is credible, the results, you then look at the results. If, there is, if the method is not credible, there's no point looking at the results. Method is really important. And so, there is so much we can learn just by looking at the legacy of the prophets, how they handle those situations, and what they have left us with so that we can proceed. And so, kind of... Let's take some examples. Let's take some examples just to clarify. Prophets often start in a hostile environment. They bring a new message. And any new message that creates a shift in the community will hit some powerful people who don't like it. Will hit interests. Will hit The whole point of sending a message is to create a society based on new values. And those values are going to upset some people. And those some people are usually benefiting from the old system. They don't want the new system to come. So they will usually resist it. So one of the first things you notice about the prophets is that they all come from the almost an unexpected place. You might call that they come from the establishment. They come from a place where they cannot be questioned in terms of their incentives. So First example, Prophet Musa Prophet Musa السلام, was born amongst an oppressed minority, the Israelites. They were oppressed, they were weak. And so if Prophet, just imagine this. I just want to show you the importance of this method and this twist. If Prophet Musa came to the community and said, well, I have come in to the Pharaoh. First of all, who, how is he ever going to speak to the Pharaoh? Like seriously, who's, how is he ever going to reach the Pharaoh in that day? But let's say he reached the Pharaoh and said, well, I, wanna, I want uh, my, ha my message to you is there is a Lord and you should stop doing what you're doing. You should free these people and you should uh, submit. One, he'll be laughed at. And two, he'll be th thought of as, of course you would say that because you're somebody on the losing end of the game. Of course you would say that. And all the others, they would say, well, he's a peasant, he's somebody who's lost everything, he's somebody who is poor, and he just wants to make a bit of money for himself. He wants to be famous, he wants to gain status, he wants to gain something he doesn't have. That's an easy thing to make. What has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala done? Sent him to the household of the Pharaoh. He, he was raised in the household of the Pharaoh. Essentially, he had everything the Pharaoh had. Essentially, if he was to tear it down, he's tearing down his own benefits. He's tearing down his own system. By challenging his own system, he's clearly sending a message. Nobody can say, well, you're doing it to gain status. Well, actually, I've already got status. You're doing it to gain money. Well, I already actually have money, probably much more than you can. Because he was so close to the Pharaoh that probably he was more able than everybody else in the community. So why would he be doing it? This is the key point. If people start asking, why are you doing this? Then step one is accomplished. Thinking. You've raised a question that people cannot dismiss. You've raised a question that people cannot dismiss. 
and then it's followed by a process of delivery and struggle and conviction until he delivers the message. Prophet Isa alayhi salam. There were two sisters. One was married to Imran, who was one of the great leaders of his community. And one is married to Zakaria, the prophet. Imagine, two sisters, one married to a great leader, and the other one married to a great leader and a prophet. Imran doesn't have any children. Then, after much prayer, he has Maryam in this household. Maryam is born. You could see, imagine her being the talk of the community when she was born. She's born to this great leader at an old age. He didn't have any children. And now he has a daughter. And then this daughter was special from the start. And then, and, and she is raised, looked after, supervised by Zakaria, the leader who's alive. Imran died when her mother was pregnant. So she was born without a father, Maryam. But Zakaria looked after her. And so she was raised in this most respected and pious of families. There was no question of seeking power. Jesus was born, in that was born in that environment. He wasn't ch challenging wealth, so he didn't need to be rich. He was challenging a corrupt religious establishment. He needed to have the religious background. You see, Musa was challenging a, f a wealthy king. He needed to be in the king sphere. Isa was challenging priests that were abusing their position of status. He needed to come from a family that were as deep as you can get. Credibility. Credibility. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born, and I think it's important to kind of know this, know this background. So we know these people and we know the, their connections and we know where, th where, where the revolution of Imam al-Hussein fits in this big picture. Prophet Muhammad was born Mecca. Mecca was a selection of tribes. The, the most valuable thing they had is the Kaaba. And because of the Kaaba, people used to go past it and it became a trade route. Essentially, caravans would go past this area, they exchange, and that's how they made their money. Essentially, if you're associated with this place, you're special by definition. If you belong to the tribe of Quraysh, which owned pretty much everything, you're even more special. If you belong to the household within the tribe of Quraysh that actually ruled Quraysh, you're even more special. And if you belong to the grandfather who is very much in charge of all of these people, so there is a committee that ran these kind of most respected services, Siqayat al-Hajj, Imarat al-Masjid, these things, and the person who was handling this is Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet. And so the Prophet was born in a household that was very much benefiting. They were really good people. They didn't oppress others. They were not, you know, they were they had beliefs. They believed the religion of Ibrahim before them. But if they wanted to, they could have do well, they were dominant in their positions of power. And the Prophet, it would have been far easier for him to just continue. If he wanted status, he had it. He became a messenger and a, sent to the people. So he was a prophet before, but he became a messenger. He delivered his message at the age of 40. 40 years before that, he was successful. He was married to a wealthy woman. He had the social status. He had everything in that community going for him. Why would you challenge it? And so in that community, lineage and social status was by far the most important thing they had. Abu Talib, the father of Imam Ali, wasn't very rich actually, he was quite poor, but he still had the social status. So it wasn't too much based on money, it was money plus social status. Social status is really important. The Prophet comes from the most noble of households. To say social status doesn't matter. To challenge the very value he would have benefited from if he wanted. That gave him credibility. That made people think, well, why is he doing this? And people, some people came to him and said, why are you doing this? Like, this doesn't make sense. If you want money, we'll give you money. If you want what, status, we'll give you status. 
But he, he already had money and status. So why would he come up with this noble idea, new idea of prophethood? That had to make people think. And then that was step one. Was that the end of it? Was that the end of it? He still, all of these prophets faced challenges from their communities. They faced um, bullying and hatred and, and lies and threats and their companions being killed, but they managed to deliver a message. And in doing so, there is a method, there's a process. And this is really, this process is, is valuable for us to learn from. Uh, and that's why we need to understand their lives and how they live. And so from this we understand, first of all, the importance of evidence. And I want to kind of keep going back and forth to the story of how the Prophet and his community led to the role of Imam Ali alayhi salam, led to the role of Imam Hassan alayhi salam, which was, which led to the role of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Why these different divine leaders acted so differently at different times, and how each one of them M stuck to a set of values that are absolute and then developed methods that were fit for purpose that worked. And so, now first of all, evidence. You will see that these prophets are infallible. The very first thing about them is that everything they give and they have is credible and valuable and, and, and correct, absolutely correct. Evidence. And I've been saying on previous nights, it's very important for us to understand our evidence that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost, that we un understand the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That leads us to prophethood and infallibility, that leads us to Imam. Because without this belief system, you get this ad hoc thinking. You get, you could, you get to pick and choose what suits you, what doesn't suit. And you get problems. And so, Part one is to really understand where do we get our evidence from today? And there are many amongst us who think, well, I'm an educated person, I'm a rational person, I'm gonna go read the Quran, see what it sounds to me, and I'll, you know, I'm a good person, right? I have good intentions. The verse said this, I'm gonna do that. And this is really dangerous. Dangerous because this is the final message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has delivered to humanity. Every piece of it is there for a reason. It's not subject to our own interpretations. And evidence requires us to go to our logic, which leads us to Allah, which leads us to Prophet, like I said, to Imam. And then what did the Imams do when Al Imam al Mahdi Farajah started his ghaybah? when he wasn't directly accessible to us as a community. He left us with a legacy, with a structure. Ahlul Bayt over generations developed the concept of Marja'i. Over generations. From the times of Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Baqir would send one of his students and say, go and sit in the mosque so that people ask you questions, you can respond. So that people know one of my companions is that knowledgeable. Now, is there a need for somebody? Like the Imam is there, right? Why would I ask his companion if I can ask the Imam? What's the point? He's doing two things. Educating us to develop our knowledge to become the likes of those companions of the Imam and educating the wider community to learn the importance of specialization. That there are Topic, these topics are important and you need to understand where to take the knowledge from. And then Al-Imam Al-Sadiq did even more than that. So he taught many students, he put them in different places and says, if you find a hard question, come to me. But he didn't tell the community, come to me directly. Go to these guys and they will come to me. By the time Al-Imam al rida documents were written, jurisprudence documents were written, actually books of fatwa by the time of Imam al-Ridha. By the time of Imam al-Hadi, al-Askari, this was com very much established. It was known who to go for, what to ask, what information, and, and the, the dependence on the Imams decreased gradually. 
So it's a process, a bit like education. You know, in education primary school, you, spo you are spoon-fed everything. You go to secondary school, they ask you to go and do something and come back, and there's a bit more thinking. Graduate school, you're independent, but you have a supervisor. Then you become a professor. It's a gradual process. Decreased supervision. And this is what happened with Ahlul Bayt. So by the time Imam Al Mahdi, then we had direct access to indirect access to him through known representatives. Do you see this gradual process? Do you see method over three hundred years? That's method over three hundred years. And then Al Ghayb Al Kubra, where we have no direct access. The Imam is there. He's protecting us. He's taking responsibility uh, for our well-being, for the world's well-being, but he's not directly accessible to us. And some might say, well, what's the, how do we benefit from the Imam now? Like, what's the benefit? And this was asked before, and, and the narration famously says, like the sun on a cloudy day. Today was a bit of a cloudy day. Could you tell day from night today? Was it clear when it was day and when it was night? It was, wasn't it? There's still a lot of benefit in the sun on a cloudy day. And so, by the way, one example of this, you might say, well, how do I know? What's the, give me some tangible benefit. One thing is insurance. Insurance. Why would you buy insurance? Why would people buy insurance? The, if you just cancel the concept of insurance in the world, it, the world will go to a standstill. Ships cannot sail, trains cannot run, cars cannot be driven. Uh, companies shut, shops, cl it'll be a, like a nightmare. What does insurance do? All it does is just provides an assurance that in the case something going wrong, things will be corrected, will be made right. If the only thing we benefit from Al Imam Al Mahdi is this insurance, is more than good enough. There's plenty more. That his presence assures us that if something goes wrong, They'll, they'll be corrected. That's all. Never mind all the other benefits. And so the Imam said, what do we do? He told us, follow scholars. And he gave attributes that they needed to have a, a level of knowledge and a level of piety. And it's a process of specialization. So we have to follow those who are able to reach sources independently to come up with knowledge. They need to be credible and they need to have that knowledge. And that's why I was talking about the process of building. Building our scholars takes decades. I'm not in a position, you're not in a position to come up with that. We can't just read a narration and say that's what it means and let's just act accordingly. That's not how it should be. And so evidence base is part one. It's really important to know where we get our evidence from. And then once we've got the evidence, then we can kind of, within the frameworks of the evidence, we can uh, emulate the methodology used by the Prophet and by Ahlul Bayt. And you see how the Prophet, when he delivered the message, first of all, it was him. Then he went to his immediate family. He was told to deliver the message to, his, to those around him. And then he went to his locality. And then he went and built an institution a state in Medina that had a constitution, had systems, had frameworks, had teams, teams with specialist knowledge, and created a shared identity that I've spoken about in previous nights. And so if you want to emulate that message, this is the framework. This is one framework we can follow. We need truth, evidence-based knowledge. Then we need to take care of ourselves, make sure that we, are, we understand what we're doing. Then we start with our immediate families, and that has an impact on who we choose to marry, who we choose to be friends with. And then go to the wider community, and, the, and our role in building communities like these, and then we go to the wider society. That's a method, a prescription for how to do things. A prescription, a successful prescription of how to do this. And so what we do sometimes, my brothers and my sisters, we turn up, and those involved in, in community work know this. People turn up and say, I want you to save my son. I want you to save my daughter. 
she's 20, he's 15, they have done this, this, that. Today, my daughter at the age of whatever, 18, decided to take her hijab off. My son stopped praying. Now the problem, my friends, with all due respect, started many years before that. Let me give you an analogy of healthcare systems. There are healthcare systems that are designed to fight disease, disease-based, like the UK system. They're designed when you have symptoms and you have uh, kind of, so you have diabetes, let's say, you go and they say, okay, you have diabetes, let's treat diabetes. There are systems which are based on well-being, which targets you at a young age to stop you eating unhealthy food so you don't become obese, so that you don't gradually destroy your pancreas, so that you don't develop diabetes. One solution looks at the symptom and tries to fix it. One solution starts at the cause. We often neglect ourselves and our families and our children for so many years. We choose our spouses, husband or wife, based on something irrelevant and then essentially choose wrongly and then when it collapses or we find ourselves in difficulty, we say, come and let's fix it. Well, if you choose right, there are less likely, uh, you're less likely to end up fixing. And so if we understand this is not just something you turn up in Muharram and go home and that's it. It's about a continuous process. It's about being engaged. It's about working hard while things are easy. When we do that, we have the confidence that we are working for Imam al-Mahdi. We are working for him. Honestly, we are. We are delivering his message and he's in charge. If we follow the evidence, then my mistakes will be corrected by him. Because he will correct the evidence. So, now that we have one method of how to do this, I think it's very important for us to kind of go back and look at the background to this, the events of art. What, this, what the story is? What's the story? Who are these people, these individuals? We have lots of names in the events of Ashura. We speak of Abu Sufyan and Muawiyah and Yazid. Uh, we speak of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and Umar ibn Sa'ad. And there are lots of names and, and how they fit together and what their roles were and, and why the events unfolded the way they did. Now, the Prophet, if we understand the community, understand the root cause, as I just outlined, why it's important, we understand the consequences and the decision making. The Prophet challenged a society that was based on social status and wealth. A minority that had a lot and a majority that were oppressed. And he redressed it through a, a system of redistribution of wealth. Taxation applies on profit, that's Khumus on profit, on what you have that's a surplus, and distribution to everyone. And that way you redistribute wealth. And that was one problem in the society in Mecca. It was a huge shock to the system, and it was a huge um, difficulty. Some benefited a lot, slaves became companions, and leaders became companions. And I mentioned an example on a previous night, Ammar ibn Yasir, the slave, is a companion, and Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, one of the wealthiest people in Mecca, is a companion. Al-Abbas is from Quraysh, the son of Abdul Muttalib, extremely wealthy, the uncle of the Prophet, and Ammar ibn Yasir. That was the system. So when the Prophet left it, he left a system that, was, that has worked and continues to work. Remember, method is important. Delivering a message, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could reveal the message either on the sky one day the Quran appears, or on every wall in the world, the Quran appears, or everyone wakes up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala downloading the Quran into his brain. You wake up memorizing the Quran. That can be done easily, but that's not much use. What needs to happen is to turn this education into a process, into something outside, which is why in schools you have a curriculum and you have a teacher. 
And so, and, and you can't just change people overnight. They need time because that's the process. And by the way, this is why they're, they're useful to us. If the Prophet, every time he faced a difficulty, raised his, his hands and said, Oh Allah, fix it, and it gets fixed. Great. Then I come. Well, I don't have that access to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have a problem. What do I do? What do I do? Oh Allah, fix it. Well, I don't have access. The same access. And so I need to see him, I need to see an impeccable person, an infallible, show me how to do it, leading by example, and struggling throughout the process. So I know I don't have his infallibility, but I have the worked example I can follow. And that's why we use worked example in, in all of our education systems. And so the Prophet left with a system that was working, and all the framework was complete, all the message was delivered, what was needed is for generations to develop an identity based on this law. Remember, the purpose of law is to set right and wrong, and then the purpose of society, networks, communities, is to evolve, to incorporate those laws to become part of daily life. This is what every institution, every country has a constitution, almost every country has a written constitution. And the purpose of what to set the framework and the society develops to have those values. And that's what the Prophet did. But by the time the Prophet... You see, the Prophet couldn't have been sent as a messenger when he was very young, because he wouldn't be credible. People think, well, he's a young man, you know, his elders are in the community, he wants to be a quick leader, he wants to be at the top, he's, you know, it's not sufficient to be from the, from the very respected people, he wants to be the very top one, and he's just, you know, a young man trying too hard. He, he was 40, he was very credible. And then he lived up, up until the age of 63, had 23 years of delivering the message, 13 years of which building foundations in Mecca. So there was 10 years in Medina. So by the time the Prophet passed away, there were people who had just converted to Islam. It was a whole mix. Some believed. Some were weak in their beliefs. They kind of, you know, the trend was Islam, all is well. Well, okay, I'm going to join. It seems good. Some Islam threatened their interests, like Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was a businessman. He led practically the disbeliever side for a long time. Abu Sufyan was involved in almost all battles. Battle of Badr, he was leading the, the caravan that rerouted. Battle of Uhud, he was the leader of the army. And he was involved in Battle of Al-Khandaq and was involved until the Prophet entered Mecca. So it's like this personality, which was the opposite almost of the Prophet. This is the person who resisted every step of the way because he had a lot, of, a lot to lose out of Islam. He didn't want to be equal to his own slaves. And so the Prophet, when the Prophet died, Abu Sufyan was alive. He left it with so many personalities, with so many different interests. And you cannot develop a community in 10 years or 13 years or 23 years. Right? There are many of us who are, well, almost, well, many of us are, are more than 13 and, and a, a reasonable percentage, majority, are more than 23. It's not su that such a long time. And so what was needed? What was needed is the message is there. What was needed is implementation over a long period of time to ensure that the message is ingrained in people's minds. What was needed is in imam. What was needed is people who are infallible, who can supervise the implementation for a long period of time over generations. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have prolonged the life of the Prophet to 300 years. He could have done that. That's one way of doing it. Another way is to just send others who are divine leaders, have the role to do that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's legacy, if you look at all the previous uh, stories of the Prophet, is lineage. And there are prophets who are the sons of prophets, and their sons are prophets. And you have the whole legacy from Ibrahim and, and many of his offspring. So that's the legacy of, of uh, that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to do it. And so when the, when the prophet died, the system was there, the legal system was there. It just needed to be implemented correctly. Everything to be given as a worked example. Over 12 Imams, you would have created a very solid, an easy way to create a solid 
uh, delivery of the message. However, that political change by um, removing the, the role of leadership from Imam Ali alayhi salam to Abu Bakr put a huge spanner in the works. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that what would happen. So there's always a plan that will always deliver. There's an easy way which you go to first. If that easy way, if people change it, there will always be another way for it to be delivered. And so Ahlul Bayt managed to deliver, and that's why we have something that's complete and comprehensive. And we have the insurance of Imam al Mahdi. We have it. There's no question of that. But there would have been a much easier way if people followed the instructions. It would have made much easier for them and much easier for everyone else. What happened though, some of those values remained. And I think it's important to understand this. So Abu Bakr and Umar were both from Quraysh. Both were on the, from those who traveled with the Prophet to Medina. Both who were part of the old system that converted to the new system. They didn't belong to the highest ranks of Quraysh. They belonged to the peripheries of Quraysh. But they viewed their life, the way they understood the world is that Quraysh should rule. And I'm quoting Umar here in his later years, he used to say it needs to stay in Quraysh. Essentially, he understood that the Prophet was chosen and Imam Ali was, was well, was chosen as well. But he, he did uh, pay his bay'ah to him because they are from Quraysh. It's like a a tribe-based system. It's a tribal leadership model. And so they thought, well, we are from Quraysh, we should continue to rule. And so I'm just going to talk about the socioeconomics very briefly of what happened. One, one small change, many changes happened after the Prophet because of that bad implementation. But one example will show you the gravity of what happened and why we ended up with the events of, of Ashura, why Imam al Hussein needed to do what he did. The Prophet used to collect uh, taxes in their various forms, khums and zakah, from the surplus and from whatever earnings that the, the state was gaining and would distribute them equally to people. So we would kind of give to the poor and at the end of the year there is usually a surplus and that surplus is distributed equally. That's a key point. So you're redressing the socioeconomics, you're taking money from the poor, the net effect from the rich to the poor. After many years people will be comfortable, equal. Omar argued based on his own thinking that how is it fair that we equate somebody who joined Islam very early on with somebody who joined Islam later? How is it fair that we equate somebody from the tribe of Quraysh to a slave? How is it fair that we, com we equate between somebody who joined Islam in Mecca and traveled with the Prophet to somebody who is in Medina and joined later? How is it fair that somebody joined when the times were tough versus somebody joined when the times are easy. Seems like a rational thing, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you not to do this. And the Prophet told you not to do this. And so he changed the distribution. And his criteria was pretty much the opposite of the intentions of the Prophet. His criteria was if you joined first, essentially if you're from Quraysh, if you belong to Quraysh, if you were from the Muhajireen, if you were close to the Prophet, you got a lot more. These people were already rich anyway. So now taxation goes from the rich and the middle classes and goes to the richer classes. Does that make sense? And so instead of giving everybody equal pay, some people were paid 500, some people were paid 25,000 dirhams. That's the scale. Now if you get, if 500, let's say 500 is sufficient for you to live. If you get paid 25,000, you have a lot of surplus. If 10,000 is sufficient for you to live, then these people are struggling hungry and those have a surplus. So what happens? Well, I have a lot of money. I don't want to do everything. I want to be lazy again. So I'm going to employ you to, to work my land for me. The Prophet worked his own land, but I now have money. So I'm going to hire you, which means you will remain poor and I'll remain rich. So I'll be richer and richer and you'll be poorer and poorer. And then after 
20 years of this, the system became very extreme. When Uthman came to power, he added another layer. He made it even more extreme. To the point when a relative of Uthman died, I'm quoting these as historical events that are validated. I'm not here trying to dig at anyone, just to really explain the facts. When one of the relatives of Uthman died, there was so much gold, they had to cut it with axes to distribute it between uh, his, uh, those who were inheriting him, essentially. So much gold. There's no gold in, in, in Mecca and Medina in this area. Gold was coming from Africa. So much gold. Now, if you had this much gold, what do you do? What, what Omar had done in the past, he had disallowed them to own land outside Medina. He had restricted land ownership. They had a lot of money, but they didn't have a, the option to buy land. Uthman said, no, you can buy land too, and gave them some. So now he ended up with people with huge land and a lot of money. And so the system was pretty much back to square one. Imam Ali comes and does, pretty much does what the Prophet did in the first place. Struggles again against a wealthy minority to rebalance it with a, a poor majority. Of course the majority loved him. He was addressing their needs and concerns. And of course the minority hated him. Because he was hitting their pockets. Right? And so... When you look at why was Abu Sufyan so annoyed? Why was Muawiyah so annoyed? Well, they are on the other side. They were the people who were benefiting. They are relatives of Uthman. They were extremely wealthy. This new tax system meant they will go back over a few years to the days of the Prophet. But Imam Ali obviously had the power and the support to do it, and he did. Now, what happens? You see, this is, this is the short-term memory of people that we need to understand in our minds. They struggled. Uthman was killed by the nation, by the way, by Muslims. There was a disagreement, a dispute. He was killed by Muslims. It was an uprise against him because of, amongst many things, because of the welfare thing. Imam Ali redistributed wealth. A few years later, he says, let's go to battle. They say, it's hot, it's in the summer. Can we do it in the winter? He says, okay. Comes the winter, do you want to do it? It's, it's cold. Can we do it in the summer? Why would you do that? Because you're comfortable. If you, if you felt threatened, you would do something. But you felt comfortable. Of course, Imam Ali was realizing this, and this is why he was talking so much to convince them to do something. But they thought, well, it's not touching me. My kids are okay. My family is okay. I'm eating well. Why should I bother? This sense of social responsibility, responsibility for others, that I talked about in a previous night that every single one of us is responsible for our communities. Because if you don't address it early on, it will come to hit your own children at some point. And so what these guys did, and it did hit their own children at some point, or them, some of them, they said, well, we'll worry about it later. Then the whole thing happened. Muawiyah by force took charge. And Imam al-Hassan was facing this very difficult situation. He would either um, raise an army and fight Muawiyah, which he could have done, by the way. We actually sometimes don't give enough credit to the vast majority of Muslims in that time. We think they were all bad people. There was only a handful who believed in Ahlul Bayt. That's actually not true. There were so many tens of thousands who believed in Ahlul Bayt and supported. But Imam al Hassan, you see, to Muawiyah, it's my who is in charge, who is leading. To Imam al Hassan, what's the long term plan? Very different objectives. Imam al Hassan wanted his main role in the community is to transfer the knowledge of the Prophet. So to do that, he needed a community that can do this. He needed people who understood the message of the Prophet. He needed companions who were alive at the time of the Prophet. If he took all the companions to war and they all died, who's going to keep the message? Who's going to continue the message? The Imam al, Imam al Hassan's supporters are credible, knowledgeable uh, people, Muawiyah supporters, are paid to fight. They're mercenaries. They're cheap. And so the Imam could have created, I don't know, 50,000 against 50,000. 
losing one of the Imam's companions is worth losing much more than 10 on the other side. Because they had knowledge, they had memory, they had the ability to teach. All the hard work of the Prophet and Imam Ali would be lost if, if he simply just took them to war. Essentially, he looked at the competitive advantage. He said, they're both men. In a battle, they are equivalent one to one. In knowledge, my men are worth far more than that. So my strategy is I'm going to use my competitive advantage. I'm going to move to an area where I'm strong. Not move to an area where I would lose so many valuable people. That's why Imam al-Hassan signed the treaty. Muawiyah thought he got a good deal. Imam al-Hassan kept the message. Started because under the treaty he could teach and he could distribute the message and he sent them far and wide to India. They reached some parts of India, large parts of Iran, borders of Russia. They spread all over the place, which means they can't be arrested and killed now because they're all over the place. They're not in one location. And it took Muawiyah a while to understand this. That he's he set himself... The, the only way for Muawiyah to pass leadership to his own son is people, if people's memory were wiped, if people forgot that. But they can't forget it because there are so many people who witnessed it and they're all over the place. And so the style was, now you would go and um, pass the message anyway to Yazid and Imam al Hussein would have, would have to fa face the consequences. And I might talk about the strategy of Imam al-Hussein on another night. But Imam al-Hussein, again, put Yazid in a position where it was a win or win or win situation. Yazid had no chance of winning it. Literally no chance. He could have left Imam al-Hussein alive, Imam would have won. He could have killed him, Imam would have won. He could have pushed him somewhere else, Imam would have won. There's just nothing, there's no other option. And so Yazid being the clever man he is, did probably the worst option. What, what was needed, there were lots of people with knowledge, but the message was being drowned by the propaganda. Towards the, la the latter years of Muawiyah's uh, ruling, he started to fabricate hadith. He started to understand, hang on, there's a problem here. There is so much of the message of Hassan spreading, but none of my message is spreading. So he needed legitimacy. So they start to fabricate hadith. And people started to kind of get a bit confused. And what was needed, an act that will be a litmus test, that will be so clear to anyone who's right, who's wrong. People would have accepted any sort of deal with Hussein, but they would have never accepted the grandson of the Prophet murdered by, the, by swords carrying the name of the Prophet. This, this convoluted argument doesn't make sense to anyone. So people ask questions. That's exactly what happened. So Imam al Hussein didn't want to take thousands with, with him to Karbala. He actually wanted to make a point, but make, invest sufficiently so the point is delivered loud and clear. Essentially, it was the same policy of Imam al Hussein delivered in a different way. Method. And so it's very important, this is how we can see and understand why the Prophet was so focused on connecting himself to Hassan and Hussein, Al Hassan and Hussein, Imaman, Iqama, Al Qaada, that they are leaders, divine leaders, whether they stand or sit, whether they rise up or not. And how he connected, so he, he, there's always Hassan and Hussein, or Hassanan for short. Like there's one word to describe these two. It's like one project. And it is also why very important for the legacy of Imam al Hassan and Hussein to merge. People think Imam al Hassan died, Imam al Hussein rose up. Actually, Imam al Hussein, 10 years after the death of Imam al Hassan, he led his revolution. There was a long period of time where Imam al Hussein was doing exactly what Imam al Hassan was doing. And then the message became clear. And so, which is why it was so important for the whole of Ahlul Bayt, not some of Ahlul Bayt, to be there in Karbala. Why all of them had to demonstrate their buying into the message. So there is nobody would come in our day and age without evidence, come and say, well, why did this guy not go? Why did this guy disagree? And where were the children of this and children of that? 
It was the whole of Ahlul Bayt and some companions like Habib ibn Mudhar al-Asadi, a Muslim. So many were there on Ashura. Essentially, it was like a sample that was built to deliver a point with maximum impact. And so with this, it's not surprising when we talk about the story of, of, of Karbala and how the events unfolded, and we have a role, an important role, for the son of Imam al-Hassan on the day of Ashura. Because this connection is really important. We need to understand Imam al-Hassan was there on the day of Ashura. He wasn't alive, but he was there. His legacy was there. His message was there. It was one method, one delivery by Ahlul Bayt to us. And you hear the story, on the, on the day of, of Ashura, Imam al-Hassan had two children at least. Had al-Qasim ibn al-Hassan and Abdullah ibn al-Hassan. Two of his children were there on the day of Ashura, kind of fighting, representing the name of Imam al-Hassan. And they were young. Both of them were actually quite young. But the point needed to be made. The point needed to be clarified to people. And so, on the day of Ashura, I told you yesterday the companions insisted that they would go first. They would fight before Ahlul Bayt, before anyone from the household of Imam Hussein would go to battle. And then when all the companions were lost, all the companions sacrificed, including some children, including some women, and Imam al Hussein started with his own son, Ali al Akbar. And Ali al Akbar goes to battle and comes back. And Imam al Hussein creates a tent. A tent for the fallen. A tent for those who come back, who go alive with the beautiful faces of Ahlul Bayt and come back in pieces, bloodied and wounded. Come back to this tent, and then the women and the children and the family and Imam Zain al Abidin would mourn them in those tents. So Ali al Akbar went and came back, and others did. At this point, historians say Al Qasim ibn al Hassan. He was the son of Imam Hassan. Some say he had a note from his dad addressed to Imam al Hussein. Some say it was verbal, that it was communicated to Imam al Hussein. That his father told him one day, Al Hussein, my brother will be on his own. You're expected to be there, support him, to fight with him. Some historians say Al Qasim didn't just come to this. He dressed in the turban of Al Imam Al Hassan. He held the sword of Al Imam Al Hassan. Essentially, it was an Imam Al Hassan, a young man in the face that resembles Hassan in the turban that belonged to Imam al Hassan, in the dress that, that was that of Imam al Hassan, came to Hussein asking for permission. Imagine Imam al Hussein. Between him and Imam al Hassan, a few months, very, very close together they were born. Imam al Hussein grew up with Hassan, remembers Hassan, lived with Hassan, and there's this really close bond between them, and now he has what is left of Hassan coming to him. A young man wearing the turban of Hassan, saying, I want to go fight with you. Imam Hussein says, You are what remains of my brother. I don't want you to go to battle. You're still a young man. Stay with your mother. They want, you know, this Ahlul Bayt want you, want to see some connection to your father. He says, I want to go to battle my uncle. And this young man goes to battle in the courage of Ahlul Bayt. He says goodbye to his uncle Hussein and goes to battle. You can imagine Imam Al Hussein watching Al Qasim head to battle. He fights them bravely. He's a young man, fights them, kills a few people, finds them very bravely. And then his slipper rips. Al Qasim bends over to his slipper to fix it. In that moment, Al Qasim is reciting as they did when they go to battle. They have a line of poetry usually to announce themselves. You know, he wants to make sure that the enemy knows who he is. So he tells them, "In Hassan, if 
you deny who I am, if you don't know who I am, I'm the son of Hassan. I'm the son of the grandson of the Prophet. إن تنكروني فأنا نجل الحسن سبط النبي المصطفى والمؤتمن هذا حسين كالأسير المرتهن He says, you see this Hussein like a prisoner. I'm going to fight for Hussein. I'm going to attack you with the courage of Ahlul Bayt to defend Hussein. I'm the son of Hassan. As he bends over to fix his slipper, a man goes to him. He says, I'm going to go kill him. One of his colleagues says, look at the number of people that have gone to kill this young man. What are you doing? And he says, no, I will go. He raises his sword. He hits Al Qasim on his forehead. Al Qasim falls to the ground, says, oh, Uncle Hussein. Oh, Uncle Hussein. And Al Imam Al Hussein runs out of the tent. And Al Qasim's mother and Sayyidah Zainab and others watch. They heard the call of Qasim on the ground. They all run to Al Qasim. Al Imam Al Hussein wipes the head of Qasim, sees Qasim, the son of his son, there. And he says, It is very difficult. It's very difficult, O oh Qasim, for your uncle to hear your call and not be able to help you or to come to you and not save you. أو يجيبك فلا ينفعك صوت والله كثر واتره وقل ناصره Imam Hussein has no supporters. He says, I have no supporters. I want to come save my nephew and I couldn't. And then Al Qasim is taken back to the tent for the family of Hussein to welcome him back. He was laid next to Ali al Akbar. Imagine Sayyidah Zainab Ali al Akbar next to him, Al Qasim. And then Al Imam Al Hussein has to leave that. So saying goodbye is hard. And then Hussein says goodbye to the family. Hussein heads to the battlefield. Hussein fights. Hussein, in those dying moments of Hussein, he's surrounded. Another son of Hassan goes to battle by the name of Abdullah ibn al Hassan. This boy runs. Imam Hussein says, Zainab, stop this boy from running. He runs. He gets to Hussein. He says, I want to be with my uncle. A man raises his sword to hit Hussein. Abdullah gets in the way. Abdullah says, I want to protect my uncle from the sword. The, the sword falls on the hand of Abdullah. The hand of Abdullah is severed. Abdullah looks to Hussein and says, My uncle, look what they've done to me. Look what they've done to me. And Imam Hussein again repeats his words that he so he feels heartbroken that he couldn't protect his nephew. And then in those moments, Harmala takes his arrow, aims for the little boy, and slaughters the little boy Abdullah ibn al Hassan. While well, he's in the arms of his uncle, and then in that scene, and Hussein is dying on the ground, and there is a son of Hassan, a piece of Hassan, on his chest. Imam al-Hussein in those moments screams, Sabran ya bani umumati, Sabran ya ahl bayti, patience, patience, O oh my household. For wallahi la ra'aytum hawadan ba'da hadha al-yawm. It's those moments where Imam al-Hussein feels that he's on the ground and his family is watching him suffer and he couldn't help this, this, these children, these innocent, beautiful children of Ahlul Bayt. But it was all, my sisters, my brothers, it was all a process of saving what mattered. It was a process based on clarity and devotion. There was a lot of strategy and thinking and methods and implementation and commitment and right people. It doesn't happen, the success doesn't happen by accident. And it's now, we are the torchbearers we are the ambassadors to ourselves, to our families, to our children. I need to understand this, this, this blessing and this responsibility. Sisters, my brothers, in the end, let us pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
that he may give us the clarity and the support and the courage to follow the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt, to emulate, to emulate Al Qasim and his brother, to make the right decision every time we face such a tough situation, to control our desires and to understand what matters and to strive for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we may succeed in this life, have this confidence in this life, this openness, this happiness, this success, and a much better reward on the day of judgment when it matters. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين